and it appears that our guest uh, is here, uh, and so we're going to bring him in. Uh, but I want I want you all to to take what he says to heart because this is going to be a perspective. We're going to hear a perspective from Sam. You know, uh, Sam is somebody who found us. Uh, he read, and I guess I'll I'll let him tell his story, uh, and we'll talk. Um, you've probably seen some of his videos. I would go subscribe to his YouTube channel right now if you can. Uh, if Sam wants to drop the link in the chat, that would be great. Uh, and he's an anti-imperialist, uh, and he joined our organization a year ago, roughly a year ago, um, you know, a year and a month or so. And uh, he's been with us ever since. Uh, and so we wanted to bring him on. So here is Sam Bismuth. Uh, here he is. Welcome, Sam. How are you? Good, Caleb. Good. It's a pleasure to uh, to talk to you again. Um, yeah, and um, today I wanted to go over some of the experiences that CPI uh, involves, right? I um, want to talk about the uh, Lynn Valley, I would call it a gathering. What would you call it, Caleb? Well, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. First okay. of all, One thing tell everyone time. your name, talk about okay. your background, you know. Right. Right. Okay, so I am Sam Bismuth, uh, and I have been a political activist for a while. Uh, CPI is not my first rodeo. I started out as a, a basically, I was working at this sort of small scale factory kitchen, right? And I became accustomed to real processes of production. And funny enough, at the time, the, uh, this is my background story. I'll tell it. At the time, the management was telling us to reduce the labor cost uh, and reduce the commodity input cost. We had a grid, they showed us, of the inputs and the budget of the kitchen, right? And I was frustrated at my job, and I heard that Marxism was something worker-centric. I didn't know much about it. But I started reading Marx and his observations about wage labor and capital and all this stuff. It all just clicked. It all made sense immediately, right? And then I and I understood and realized then the opposed interests of workers and capitalists, right? And from there, I joined the IWW because they're militant unionists. You know, they want to make labor unions, right? But I found they were very ineffective at making real labor unions. And I wondered, why aren't they effective? And at the same time, I also became more interested in Marxism-Leninism because it seemed like that was a living uh, evolution of Marxism at the time. I was just interested in it. And I was reading Mao and I was reading uh, Lenin. And I was saying, this makes a lot of sense. We can't just make unions, we have to start thinking on a bigger scale and start thinking about the nature of the state itself and the class rule. And that's when I became attracted to communism, real communism, Soviet communism, right? So from the IWW, I moved to the PSL because I was frustrated with the IWW's lack of a broader view and analysis. And I wanted to be with a group that understood real communism, you know. And the thing is that in PSL, there was the same sort of issue. And I couldn't quite figure out what was wrong with PSL. And it wasn't until I was exposed to Caleb and CPI's message that it all started to click. They were putting basically wokeness, to put it simply, they were putting wokeness over the desire to have real economic material change. Right. And when I realized that that's what was going on, I had to join CPI. And I, I found that CPI is pretty much the only communist group that has uh, simultaneously avoided the question of wokeness. We allow our members to be liberal or conservative, progressive, it doesn't matter to us because we understand that these things, there's a diversity of opinion among the American people, but we centralize around real practical economic issues. And at the same time, maybe there's some anti-woke groups that exist that are communist, but those groups do not support modern China. 
they, those groups generally do not have a more open view of communist history as it has really progressed and what it really means in the present day with Deng Xiaoping onwards. And so I found that that CPI was ideologically aligned with me, which is why I decided to join and see, because ideas are one thing, right? So I decided to join to learn what actually goes on in CPI. So and there. that that led you a year ago to a place called Lynn Valley, Kansas. Now, do you want to talk about that? That was your first exposure to the Center for Political Innovation in real life, which is very different than being on the Internet. Very different, I will say. And it's, um, you know, it's very important for you to meet with like minded people. I remember when I first joined PSL, I was just overjoyed that I had met people that saw um, China and the Soviet Union as good, you know, good forces, right? And, you know, that was my first realization of just how important it is to, to meet like-minded people, all this stuff. But with CPI, right, with CPI in particular, um, I remember I was very apprehensive because I had been burned in the past. You know, mm. uh, my experience with PSL, it was a bitter end. And I don't even think, I didn't even leave PSL when I first uh, wanted to join CPI. And I did have a time in between. I was part of neither. But, you know, I... I You're two timing. You're two timing. I, I, but I, I practically, me, I was. I but Let and, me point out, yeah. CPI does allow dual membership. We have no it ban does. on that, right? And so we have members of Party of Communists that are with us, members of the LaRouche movement that are with us, uh, members of uh, members of different communist groups. You know, we don't have any ban on that. So there you go. But but continue. Right. Because we're not a party, right? No, we're and not. Yeah. So I was taking the train down to Lynn Valley. And if I remember right on that train, I was reading some Lenin to try to brush up on things, you know. And I just remember arriving and, you know, I what I was expecting, I didn't know what to expect. But it wasn't what I was expecting because I was thinking, you know, maybe this is like a cult. Maybe this is a weird thing, you know. But no, it was just the most wholesome, friendly experience. And it was like down to earth people who genuinely cared about trying to to uplift the condition of fellow Americans who genuinely wanted a new system. And it was just it. It was so amazing to meet people. And I just, you know, ever since then, I've been hooked on CPI. If I had the time and money, I would have attended pretty much every CPI event that's gone on since then. And the only reason I was late is because of those distractions of, of, of you know, trying to build a, a life for myself, a career for myself. But Sure. Well, before you yeah. go any further, because your story takes an interesting turn after this. Um, right, right. Uh, but I want to actually have the video, some video from the opening of that retreat I thought I'd put on just so people get a sense of, I mean, this is how the retreat in Lynn Valley, Kansas opened, right? So there you go. This is what you what you saw at the lodge in Lynn Valley. Dare to struggle! Dare to win! Out of the movement! To the masses! 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 Free Assange! Free Assange! Free Assange! Free Assange! Go Brandon! Let's go Brandon! Let's go Brandon! Let's go Brandon! Slava Dombasu! 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 Dare to struggle! Dare to win! 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 Come all of you good workers, good news to you all.
memories huh there you go yeah um and you know what's funny is it was after you know yes we had fun our ceremonies conversations all these things so much learning it was lecture after lecture after lecture of just really great stuff that is all up on youtube uh for the most part um so you know you can you can get this education cpi has so much free high quality communist education content and i think not enough people are are tuned into that cpi uh official channel you know this is caleb's channel it's great but you know there's there is other stuff too there um and you know i just i remember learning so much and it was amazing to hear uh all of the different speakers and you know it was it was just it was such a wholesome thing right because we had new members of CPI who were just learning how to give speeches. They were just figuring it out and they were just, you know, and, and that's, that's how we are. We have more experienced members. Like, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more experienced because of my history or making all these videos or whatever. Right. But there was a time when I was just like that. I had, you know, a lot of difficulty, maybe public speaking, or I didn't have a good like depth of research. Right. But, all that changes over time. And if you integrate yourself with CPI and dedicate yourself to this stuff, you'll end up in a, in a spot where you can do a lot of what Caleb is doing, you know, and, and I want you to remember, there's nothing inherently special or unique about me. It's just that I dedicated myself to this stuff. That's the main thing. Um, uh, well, we, we do find you to be special and unique, Sam, but well, you know, thank you. Thank we, you. We, you know, we appreciate your humility, but there you go. Right. And and I just think it was such a, a wonderful, valuable experience. And I really, you know, I, I anybody who has any doubts about CPI, like, oh, you know, I don't know about this whole thing. If you attend one of these uh, things where we can really get personal, you know, because people get distracted and confused by maybe showmanship, right? We love showmanship. We love to show to the public who we are, but you know, people get confused and think that that's what CPI is, but really we're more like, uh, uh, you know, a group of sincere friends based on our commitment to mm -hmm. a new America. Right. And that's, that's really the core of, of what CPI is. You know, we we're comrades in that sense. Yeah, we, we are. Super chats are received, by the way. We'll be we'll be doing that in the second half of the show, but it's received and any more, you know, they'll be coming in. We'll, we'll answer in the second half of the show. But yeah, um, so I think you wanted to talk about then at the retreat, a, as the retreat was ending, uh, some stuff happened. You want to talk right. about that? So this is a, and this is a wrinkle I was waiting because I really want to give a positive impression before I say something that anyway. There is a certain person, won't name them, right? Yeah. Now, we were on a beautiful lake, 
you know, we had a basically a vacation house that we were staying at and we had a beautiful lake and this person took me out on the lake, just me and this person. Yeah, on a little rowboat. There were rowboats. Yeah, just on a little rowboat and, yeah. and told me that they think that this whole thing is a cult. This whole thing is brainwashing and here's why. And at the time, my mind was so full of everything going on. You know, it's like you your mind is completely full of all the activities and all the education and all this stuff. And you hear something like that and you can't process it at that moment. You really – so he – they don't want to – anyway, took advantage of me being mentally – highly loaded right and told me these things that gave me these doubts and these confusions about maybe this is a cult maybe this whole thing this whole thing the purpose is not to educate people about socialism it's not to try to build an effective org but it's to make me caleb's puppet <laughs> caleb's little soldier right? right and i had to really think about it afterwards i right. did because I don't know. I had never done anything like this before. You know, I had never been part of a political org that brought people together in such a special and unique way, you know, and, and was so dedicated to these great things. It almost seemed too good to be true in a way, you know? And so yeah. I was thinking, you know, all these things. And over time I realized complete con. I, it's complete wrecker behavior on part of this person trying to deceive me and the fact that i was almost deceived and the fact that i had to seriously consider it before i reconsidered my whole experience with lynn valley and said what what's the what was cult there was not a single cult activity going on there was nothing at all that was going to determine my behavior and thought as a free individual nothing Nothing. Yeah. You could be completely liberal and open, come to that whole thing, go through the whole thing, come out of it just as liberal and open as you were before. There was no, I mean, I can't think of a single cult thing that happened the whole time. The chanting. Okay. So black lives matter is a cult then, because that's what they <laughs> did. They all chanted in unison, right? Mm -hmm. So is that, there are they a cult? Because I don't hear anyone calling Black Lives Matter a cult, and they sure did a lot more chanting than we did, you know. So I, yeah, it's exactly. It's like saying summer camp is a cult. It and it was. It's just crazy because you think you're not vulnerable to somebody trying to manipulate you into thinking these things. You think you're not vulnerable to it, but you actually are. You actually are, and and. I, looking back on it, I understand why I was able to be tricked, but at the same time, it's just so ridiculous. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense at all. And I, I, this is a warning, right? If you're listening to this right now, this is a warning because somebody that you trust, somebody that seems nice is going to lead you astray and they are going to say things that are not true. And you're going to have to deal with that, right? And that's the reality of political organizing. There are going to be people that come and try to lead you astray. There will be people that you trust that you shouldn't have trusted. And that's the reality. And I don't want to overemphasize this because the relationships of trust that I've built with many members of CPI, I want them to last, right? And I want to feel good about them. And I do feel good about them. Right. But at the same time, be wary, be wary, because the one person who has one or two criticisms of CPI. Yeah, it's a cookbook, right? They're going to cook me. The one person who seems to have maybe one or two reasonable criticisms of CPI, but doesn't bring them to the leadership of the org. Yeah. Right. Doesn't yep. make them an internal discussion, but instead tries to recruit members into a group of dissident wreckers, right? That person is going to seem very reasonable at first until you maybe think about it enough, right? If you're if you're smart, if you've got a, 
a nose for it, right? Even being in IWWPSL, I saw wrecking attempts against us in those groups, right? Yeah. And so I did have a bit of a nose for it, to be honest. You know, I caught on pretty quickly to what was going on, but seriously. I mean, this was, I mean, this was some classic like government infiltration, you know, cult awareness network, Steve Hassan's people. And what, what was most crazy about it is if we were some kind of brainwashing authoritarian group, the last thing that would ever be allowed to happen was for you to go off on your own in the middle of the day, you know, on a boat with one other member. So he could, he could, you know, plant your head full of, full of anti CPI stuff. And that, these wreckers, we found out they weren't even participating in the classes and we let them, you know, they wanted to go outside and have a cigarette for the whole day and just sit out there and smoke and talk smack against the group. And we let them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which again, if this was some kind of authoritarian group, we would have seen them doing that and seen them. I think Tyler used the phrase too cool for school. Basically they formed their little huddle outside of the, uh, outside of the, the the building where the classes were going on. They formed their little huddle uh, to smoke cigarettes and talk smack the whole time. And we mm -hmm. allowed it to go on because it's a pretty open group, you know? Um, and uh, it was pretty wild, um, you know? And we now found out, you know, we see who these people were connected to. Uh, I mean, more revelations have come out. Turns out now we have confirmation uh, that they were getting paid they got paid to do what they did. We have a screenshot. One of them has admitted that, right? Have you seen this? Do you know what I'm I talking about? I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, there we go. It let me pull it up. Surprise me, but let, let me pull it up. Yeah, this is very important. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me let me pull it up here. Uh, yeah, yeah. He admitted uh, on one of the people that signed the document against us admitted it was paid work. Um, you know, um, and that was um, that was you know that was pretty pretty big. Uh, let me just see if I, oh, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the guy, he was a member of CPI, Yankee Tanky, uh, and he has now con admitted in a tweet uh, that it was paid work. This is what he said. He said, they spend all your time attacking you because they are paid, just like the Medium article, which he would know because he signed it. That was a paid for attack. People were paid to do that to you. That's so, what we all suspected. Yep, that's Confirmed. what we all suspected. Confirmed. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so, you know, this was some heavy level government infiltration, right? And everything these people said has been pretty well debunked. Uh, and you know, you you were one of the people they tried to recruit to their their sinister wrecking operation. Uh, so that was kind of neat. That's that's kind of a neat experience. Right. And that kind of shows, you know, there's a whole history of informers and infiltrators and and all of that. And that's how, you know, you're doing serious politics. You know, if we were just uh, we were just being silly and, you know, going going for a walk in the park, none of this stuff would concern us. But when you're in the game for real, this is when you get uh, deep state intelligence kind of operations being waged against you. And, uh, you know, I exposed the Dr. Steve Hassan, the cult awareness network guy. I exposed that he's an advisor to ContraPoints. He's an advisor to Vosh. He's an advisor to the bread tube people. He was been helping them uh, to put out their content and they apparently did not like that. Um, and, uh, you know, one of our one of our members families was upset about him spending a lot of time with us and, and going out of state with us. And one thing led to another and he got in touch with them. And now uh, we understand how this attack was carried out. Um, mm. And I mean, it shows you that, uh, that these forces are real. But but your story certainly doesn't end last July. So you've got a lot more to say. So why don't you continue, Sam? Tell us more. Right. So, of course, after I was able to digest my Lynn Valley experience and realize it's like, uh, cult, what cult what, chanting? What? Oh, yeah. it's the fact that we were encouraged to have, uh, personal friendly conversations with each other. Is that what it is? <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and there are signs too. There are signs, you know, being in a separate group is one thing, right? Being in a separate group, not talking to leadership. There's, there's signs. Uh, that that you can you can use to detect these type of people and and I think our organization is a lot more resistant now. I think the people that stayed with us throughout this whole thing are way more reliable and trustworthy. Um, so I'm actually in in a way I'm glad because a lot of people just they were liabilities, right? Yeah. If you were able to be recruited to that, you were a liability. I'm sorry and. 
you know, I'm, I'm in a way I'm glad, uh, but let's, let's move on to, to these other experiences, right? Sure, I want sure, to give you, we, we relaunched in November of that yes. year and uh, yeah. And you were, you were right back with us at the time of the relaunching. You were consulted with on the, uh, the relaunch video and everything. So why don't you continue your story? Right. So I, after that, I was like, well, I've seen a CPI, I don't know if you'd call it a gathering, right? But that was the more internal educational type thing, which did have new people in it, right? They always have new people and all this stuff, but it was more of an internal deal. You know, it was less public facing, right? Mm -hmm. And the conferences, right? These are the shows, right? And these are, these are the places and it's fun. It's fun to be a showman and it is fun yes. to have these ceremonies and it can actually be very serious too. Uh, you know, I, I went to Chicago was my first one. I remember it very well. Um, and I went with Sage, right? So hi, hi Sage. I don't know if he can hear me. I'm in, I'm in his house right now, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I went with Sage to Chicago and I remember, uh, going there, I remember meeting the Uhuru people. We had people from Uhuru actually there, and they were very friendly, and we had interesting conversations. Yeah. Well, the raid on their homes had just happened July yeah. 29th of last year. And so I immediately, I heard about those raids. My phone was going off all morning. All kinds of people were calling me from, from, from RT, from WBAI, saying that this had happened. And so we said, we have to support them, you know, and we right. showed their press conference on our YouTube channel. And, and then we called them up and they said, all right, we're going to send people to your conference. Uh, and they did. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, that was great. And Tara Reed was also at that. Yes. Conference. And Garland Nixon uh, yes. and Nick Brana. I mean, that was a really, really powerful uh, conference. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, it was it was just great. I mean, I remember the powerful speeches. Um, Tara Reed, you know, I was crying when she started talking about Palestinian children and all this. And it was I mean, really, it. It's one thing to see it on the screen. It's another thing to be there among all the people watching. And, you know, and the thing is, this is my advice for, for members going to the conference, though. Always remember the goal is, yes, it's to bring people into the physical conference, but it's also the camera that's sitting back there. Sure. Please pay attention. Don't stand in front of the camera. <laughs> Please don't stand in front of the camera. Don't let the camera see you picking your nose. Okay. Right. <laughs> Remember, right. the purpose is to get a, a message out there, right? And it's showmanship. And that's why we choreograph it. That's why we have songs. You think people just spontaneously burst out in song for no reason? Of not. Yeah. No, we plan it all, right? And that's yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And and um, you know, it's 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 fun to do it it is fun to do it sometimes we have you know more or less experienced speakers or musicians on stage you know you if you want to get on stage and you work hard to, to to get something for the conference you should do it because the more you do it the better you'll get and the more professional we're going to look as an org um you know i want to get a suit soon so i can i can help represent the org just by looking you know just by looking the part yeah, and um, what we do is not that much different than what the Democrats do, what the Republicans do. You know, you put on a show for your conference. They obviously do it with a, a huge budget. You know, we obviously don't have a huge budget. But, you know, I mean, take a look at what the economic freedom fighters just did, you know, in South Africa. That was a, an amazing, amazing, huge budget show to promote anti-imperialism and socialism. And it's been going all over the web, you know, and they had red berets just like we did. Right. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, um. Well, I didn't personally see it, but I i mean, yeah, yeah. OK, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it was great. Right. I mean, they, they, they have a very important political role, the EFF. Um, and, um, you know, seeing the the CPI doing these things. And the funny thing is, it's like our budget CPI compared to PSL. PSL pulls in so much money from its members and it yeah. has actually millionaire donors. Uh, right. That support things affiliated with PSL, like the people's forum. And they put on a show that's cheaper than like, it looks cheaper than anything CPI did way less professional, total mess. And Every, everything I see other communists do is boring and woke. 
Yes. Boring it, and woke. Uh, and yeah. It, yeah. I, I, I don't get it. They, it. It's there. I have been to so many communist events that there's no music. There's no nothing. It's just person after person reading a statement on behalf and looking with an angry look on their face. And then on top of that, the politics that you hear are not genuine, revolutionary, working class, populist, anti-imperialist politics. Uh, you're hearing about, you know, white skin privilege and transgender theory and intersectionality and all this all this stuff that's, I mean, you know, maybe there's some truth in some of it, but it ain't Marxism, you know, and it's not what I came here to talk about. I could talk about that at a, a university. I could take gender studies if I wanted to talk about that. I am here to talk about Marx, Lenin and Mao and Stalin and Enver Hoxha and Che Guevara and Deng Xiaoping. And that's what I came here for. And, you know, that's what CPI is for. Absolutely. And I love learning from you, Caleb. And, you know, it's it's that CPI's goal is to, to give people that unique educational and history is interesting right history doesn't have to be this boring rote thing no there's so many stories in history there's so much interesting and crazy stuff that's happened throughout the communist movement and and you know you need to you need to get that charisma up and really try to get people enthused and find these nuggets right and and really really engage people. And, and I'm not just saying you, because you already do that, but just in general, like we CPI, I love to see when we're great showmans. I just love to see it. And, and I, I really, I, I think we've gotten better at it. Every conference is bigger and better than the last uh, one. And um, I just, I, I love to see that stuff. And before um, you go on about that Chicago yeah. conference, I've mentioned this sure, before, sure. but I cannot stress this enough, right? Because August 6th, you know, that was this, this Sunday, Saturday, August 6th, last year was the anniversary. So it's been one year. That conference, we brought together Tara Reid, uh, Garland Nixon, the Yahuru movement, Nick Brana of the People's Party, right? And that conference, people have no idea how pivotal that conference was, right? At that conference, Tara Reid had never heard of the Yahuru movement. And she met them. And Tara Reid ended up working for Kim Iverson, becoming Kim Iverson's producer and arranging for Kim Iverson to put them on the Kim Iverson show. And then Tara Reid ended up going on Tucker Carlson's show. She told Tucker Carlson about the Uhuru movement. And Tucker Carlson came out and supported the Uhuru movement. All because of this conference. All because we flew Tara Reid in from Oregon to give her an award for standing strong against Biden. And, you know, and that happened. And the fact that, you know, Glenn Beck, Tucker Carlson, Kim Iverson all came out for you. That happened because of that conference. What else happened? Nick Brana flew in. He's the head of the People's Party. And he saw that we were organizing protests and that there was, you know, opposition to that. And he talked with uh, Chris Alali of the of the Party of Communists. And he talked with Garland Nixon. And you better believe that. As a result of that conference, and then he later met with people from the Schiller Institute, the Rage Against the War Machine rally that happened in Washington, D.C. is a directly traceable to that conference that happened in Chicago, right? We made the Rage Against the War Machine rally happen. We made, we made Tucker Carlson come out for Yuhuru. We and, and now, and let's add that Tara Reid, who spoke at our conference, you know, she may not be the most famous person in the world, but she's been forced into exile. She's in Russia. She had to flee the country. They told her if she comes back that she'll be arrested immediately at the airport. So, you know, if you were at that conference, which there was only 75 people there, it wasn't a huge crowd. You were in the center of history, right? This was like being in a room where the Black Panthers were like planning their free breakfast program. Like this, is this was like, uh, you know, this was like being, being at one of the rallies in the lead up to the 1963, I have a dream speech of Dr. Martin Luther King. This is like, you know, this would be like sitting in a room with Eugene Debs and the Wobblies, you know, in, in the 1920s, you were like right in the center of it. And people often don't, don't seem to understand that, that tiny rooms, you know, with only 75 people in them and all of that, that's where great ideas and great movements are born. You know, uh, and and people don't don't realize that uh, that a lot of times it starts small. Right. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party started. It only had 60 members and it started with a meeting of 20 people in the basement of a women's college dormitory. Did you know that hmm. at the French concession, an area of China that was seized by France? They met in the basement of a women's college dormitory and they founded the Chinese Communist Party. And then the second day, the police had been following them. 
Uh, they realized they couldn't have it in the basement of the dormitory. So they rented a boat and they took the boat out in the middle of, of a lake and they finished the, the Chinese Communist Party conference. Right. And that, like, I mean, if you are at the stuff that CPI is doing, you are like right in the middle of the struggle. Like you are in history. You are saying, I will, I will play a role in history. You're taking hold of the future and you're saying, I am responsible for the future of the human race and I'm going to do something. Right. And it, it puts you in a very small minority because most people don't do that, but it puts you in some rather pivotal situations. So why don't you continue? Because you've been to many more of our conferences. You know, we have some other exciting goings on that we've done. So go ahead, continue with your story, Sam. Yeah. And, and you know, one thing I, I also really strongly remember about these conferences is just the chills that you get just the 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 fact that you it's it's hard to describe exactly but it's like almost like something coming down from space you know and zapping you it's it's really there is just this incredible energy that you get that is very just it gives you a lot of hope and faith for the future of this country seeing a genuine unity of different people very different people yes. you know um i mean it's just so uh um and yeah exactly cpi doesn't tell you what to say what not to say and we don't cancel people no right? we, we do not cancel people um i love what you said about chicago i i don't know what else to say about it because i think you you covered it better than you know and anyway but I'll, I'll just say this much, the conversations too, the conversations that occur at these conferences, you know, the people you meet and, and the conversations you have are just so important. And it's, it's just, just being there. You, you have to be there. I don't know. It's, you have to be there. Um, now the Chicago uh, was the conference I went to at that point, which was, I guess, exactly a year ago. That's crazy to think. Time mm -hmm. has really flown since then. Um, speaking of flying, <laughs> I flew out to D to Washington, D.C. for another uh, CPI conference. And this one had, um, well, it had some of the same people. I, I don't have, I don't have the list of the people and why they're important and all this stuff. I'm sorry. I'm That's a member of CPI. I did not organize this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just the guy. I'm just the guy. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, I yeah. we are our yeah. summit against hypocrisy that we did in March. We had Scott yeah. Ritter. Uh, you know, uh, we had uh, Garland Nixon. We had Dr. Wilmer Leon. Uh, we had Nick Brana of the People's Party. We had Jyoti Brar from the Communist Party. That's Great right. Britain, That's right. Marxist Leninist. Um, yeah, I mean, we had a lot of important guests, both domestically and internationally. It was quite yeah. a quite yeah. a conference. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was really great uh, seeing meeting Scott Ritter for the first time. He's a heck of a man. He's huge, you yes, know, he and he's he's straight to the point. You know, I mean, I just remember talking to him. I only said a few words and I was immediately just humbled by his his presence. Um, I remember Jyoti and, you know, it's it's great because we both, uh, you know, CPI and Jyoti and me personally as well celebrate Soviet communism and the glorious uh, struggles and revolutions of the time, and uh, the, to see them keeping that flame alive, right, uh, of the old school kind of communism is really something special. And even though we had like internal maybe debates about uh, this or that thing, at the end of the day, we were still sincere friends, and we knew that we we believed in the same things and were working towards the same kind of goals. And it was it was um, you know it's the diversity of CPI is just so special. Uh, you 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 have like the PSL type, right? And the diversity of the PSL type. And yeah, hey hey Tyler, hey Tyler, <laughs> hey Peter. We had I had such great conversations with Tyler and Peter as well, and and just the the having varying people, varying perspectives coming together and having disagreements respectfully, and being able to say we agree, we have the same type of goals and the same orientation, um, and and leaving the door open, right, mm -hmm. and saying we we know that American socialism. 
doesn't entail a particular thing, but rather that it's an open door and we can all freely think for ourselves about what it entails and debate it. And we can try to, to understand things in our own way while at the same time coming back to the core beliefs of CPI uh, and, and the four point program, which is just a very straightforward, bare bones socialist program that it's, you know, pretty much impossible to, to find fault with it because it's just so simple and straightforward, you know, bringing people together to rebuild America, uh, re-examining our property relations, uh, you know, our creating people's banks, um, you know, these, these, these fundamental things that any sane socialist would believe in these things. And it's just that those are the points of unity. It's just that you can interpret it how you want and you can imagine a better world in the way that you want. And we understand that the American socialist project is going to be many different views and many different people with different needs and aspirations coming together to create something real rather than saying, we know what that reality will be. And you have to adhere to what that reality will be. And we're prescribing every little bit of it. Here's how gender is going to be in that reality. Here's how whatever, right? No, we don't, we don't do that. We don't do that. And, and that's just a gorgeous thing. The fact that we're able to ally with Uhuru, the fact that we're able to agree with Scott Ritter. And Scott was just astounded that he would find himself in the same room as communists, agreeing mm -hmm. with them and wanting to, to fight for the same things. You know, Scott was just like, I, <laughs> I remember him saying, you know, I was, uh, had a kill a commie for mommy type of view of Russia. And, and he's saying he just, he's amazed that he's finding common ground with us. And that's the beauty of this, this anti-imperialist socialist unity that we're creating. And the fact that it's open in this way leaves the potential for growth and leaves the potential for that meaning to just grow and expand exponentially. It's extremely powerful and we have not seen the last of it. I'm telling you, this is only the beginning. We're just like a little sprout, you know, only a few years old. Um, and, and seeing even just from Chicago to D.C., the evolution of the conference, right? Our speakers became more experienced, right? We had people that better understood the concepts of CPI and socialism and socialist history, you know, everyone's getting more educated. They're becoming better presenters and they're becoming better cadre, for lack of a better term. Um, and it, it's, it, you know, this evolution, it's going to take years. It's going to take work. Um, but starting from scratch like we are, I'm just amazed at what we've built just starting from scratch, you know, just pretty much having nothing, you know, Caleb, a few of his friends and just some ambition pretty much. And you know, look at where we are now. I mean, conferences that have maybe a hundred attendants, soon it's going to be more. We know it's yeah. going to be more. Absolutely. And we've already changed the course of the history of this country. And we intend to keep doing that, you know, because we love this country. We don't hate this country. And that's the thing, you know, what we do, everything we do is motivated by love, you know, and a desire to improve the world, you know, and that kind of sets us apart from, you know, a lot of, you know, what you describe with wreckers internally, but it, it, it that's kind of what most of these groups that, that maybe they're not wrecking internally necessarily, but they're wrecking the country. That's what they want to do. There are people that are angry and they want to wreck. That's well, not what we are. I will interject for a sec and say, it's funny because there was a wrecker in PSL and she was more woke than PSL. <laughs> and that's why she wrecked. And th that's the thing, no matter how woke you are, there will always be someone more woke who wants to take you down and there's no limit to it. Right. <laughs> it's a fact. There's no limit to wokeness. There is none. Right. Uh, there, yeah. There's always some sexual minority you left out, no matter how many letters you put on LGBT, you know, there's always one that you forgot. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> wild, wild times. Well, um, yeah. Um, I mean, now um, you were part of the group that confronted Sa Ing Wen. Yes. Um, do, um, I, you, I, I figure I can show the video of that, but do you want to describe like what that was like? Uh, yeah. Before, or do you want me to show the video first or what do you want me to do? Um, 
Well, how about I, I'll give a little intro? Okay, just a okay, little bit. Ahead. Because we had no idea what we were doing. We just said <laughs> she's probably going to Now you're be... giving it away. It was all supposed to be our master plan, Sam. <laughs> you're, you're exposing <laughs> us, right? But but go ahead. Go it's ahead. True. Okay, okay. But this is genuine, okay? This is genuine. <laughs> yeah. We knew she was staying at this hotel. We didn't know she would be there when she was there. And there was nobody there except for a few police. It's like we had no idea what we were doing. But then she came out of the building. And it was, I mean, now you just play the video. Just right. play so the this video. Is, this is the, the so-called president of Taiwan. Uh, she came to the United States to beg for money. Uh, for more weapons to threaten China with. And uh, the CPI found out what hotel she was staying at. Uh, when she first arrived at that hotel, there were there were protests, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But uh, this was this was later in that day after her first arrival had happened. Uh, you know, after her first arrival, uh, you know, we just kind of set up outside the hotel and this is what happened. Present what the American people want. All the polls show that the American people don't want a new war. The American people are sick and tired of our money being wasted on bombs and weapons and destruction, provoking a war with China, provoking a war with Russia, while our trains are derailing, people in the United States are suffering, our water's not being purified, our railroads are falling apart, our power grids are falling apart, and yet we pour more and more weapons and money into some stupid confrontation with China. China is not our enemy. Wall Street bankers are our enemy. No more provocations against China. China is not our enemy. 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 Get out of our country. Stop trying to sell war in our country. Try, stop trying to sell war in our country. We don't want a new war with China. We love America and we don't want a new war with China. China is not our enemy. Stop trying to sell war. Get out of our country. Stop trying to sell war. China is not our enemy. I'm a patriotic American. I love my country and I don't want World War III. Yep. There you yeah. go. That was that was an epic moment, was it not? That I mean, I will always remember that moment. That's those words are like burned into my head. And <laughs> just China is not our enemy. Get out of our country. And mm -hmm. believe me, this was not this is a funny thing because she's like smiling like nothing's going on, right? Like you'd think the video is is edited or something because she's so like it's not. It's not. Yeah, you can and, see our signs in the background. Yeah. That was, um, you know, we had our footage of our protest, and then we had the French, uh, the French Press International. That was their footage of her as she's walking by, and you see our signs, and it's like the, yes. the headline they gave it was like French President enters car amid protesters or something like that. I mean, it was wild. Yes, and it's yeah. We had to go through actually painstaking effort to find all of the different press and video to to that we could assemble to clearly show what had happened there and that clip actually should have gone viral to be honest based on the sheer scale and importance of what we were doing we only had four or five people there we should have had a hundred people there yeah. just based on the sheer we should have had a thousand people there we should have flooded the streets to tell her to get out of this country and and you know it was it, I just, it blows my mind that it was just us there. And this video should have gone viral. We did yeah. get many, many views on it. Well, in Chinese viral. social in China. media, it was yeah. millions and millions of views, right? Yes. Um, you know, yeah. and uh, and then the next day, you and I were both interviewed at the protest that happened the next day out of, outside of the place where she was speaking and all of that. Um, the U.S. social media did not. Uh, it, it got you know, a couple hundred views, like 300, 400 shares on Twitter. Um, and what I thought was interesting was the main reason that it didn't go as viral as you might think in the United States was because there's a lot of these grifters on the Internet who don't actually support China. They pretend to support China, but they're opposed to building any actual movement. They just get on the Internet and go like America sucks. America's racist. You know, you know, I hate this country, you know, and they are opposed to building any actual movement. And they all basically huddled up and they they wouldn't share it. You know what I mean? Um, well, and, yeah. and people are afraid 
to mm -hmm. stand up, right? Yes. We that was us exercising our free speech rights, and people maybe that call it some people called it aggressive. Okay, oh. well, it wasn't any form of real aggression, right? And it, people when they see someone actually standing up, they're either jealous and toxic, right? They don't, or they simply say, oh no, oh no, you know, don't really resist, just complain, you know, mm -hmm. don't yeah. really try to achieve anything at all. Just, you know, exactly, just whine. And and that's in a lot of ways, the internet, because mm -hmm. I will say this, uh, before we went to see Tsai Ing-wen, we also protested in DC, yes. right? And uh, part of that was part of our rally. And there was also some street protests that I did with a small group of people uh, with Caleb, right, of the uh, uh, State Department, the mm -hmm. Victims of Communism Museum, sure. you know, and all that video is up there. It's on my channel. It's on Caleb's, I believe, as well. And, yeah. um, you know, it's it, it was um, very different than how the, the PSL street protests were for a few important reasons as well. Uh, uh, because we, first of all, we are actually where the people are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, PSL loves to protest in the middle of nowhere. I don't know why they do it. Every local branch finds a random highway or street corner <laughs> to go yell on, or there's literally nobody there or like five people that are annoyed, right? Right. And the That's other true. thing is that our message is so powerful, right? We didn't, we don't sound hysterical. We sound rooted in real principles and values we sound like we can move mountains with our words right it's it's really so much more powerful and the people on the internet will whine and complain and whatever but the people in real life they maybe they ignore us but a lot of times we had people stop and stare because finally somebody's there speaking the truth you know, you can walk around the city for years and you'll hear all these protesters and it's always this or that. You know, maybe it's some church that's telling you to, you know, go repent or maybe it's uh, 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 some PSL or DSA type telling you America's racist and evil or, you know, or maybe it's, you know, but you don't hear anti-imperialists in the street speaking a sober and genuine message. And, and that's something extremely special. And when people recognized and saw who we were, um, I mean, the support we got in real life was just amazing. And, and it's funny because you hear people say, oh, the Internet is you can only be a communist on the Internet. You can't be a communist in real life. It's the other way around. You're mm -hmm. a communist on the Internet and you're a genuine communist. You get a lot of shit. And these people in real life, they would never be willing or able to stand up to you. They might hate your message. They might try to mock you, but if you respond and if you stand strong, they're going to walk away. They can't, yeah. they can't stand there in front of you and genuinely tell you to stop because they can see and feel where you're coming from. Right. Absolutely. And you know, I, I will say that it's like, we have just a completely different style of protesting than than some of these other communist groups do. Because when, when we protest, it's not about trying to get the biggest crowd we possibly can uh, and then feeling like we're important because we're in charge of it, right? And that's a big part of it. I mean, I used to call PSL the king of the protest cage, right? It's that, you know, whatever the trendy liberal cause is, they get the stage, they set up the permit, and then they get to be like, well, if you want to speak, you got to go through us. We're the bosses, you know, uh, yeah, you know, and so then it's like, how big of a crowd can they be the boss of? Like, that's the game. Right. And how how slick can they be to get the permit? And it's like this like ego trip of like, yeah, well, there were a thousand people who marched for abortion today, but we re ran the stage. Yeah. Look at us. Yeah. That's not yeah. what we're doing at all. You know, we we have protests where there's five people. We have protests where there's 10 people. It's about getting the message out and doing it in a way that grabs people's attention. We don't protest around the latest trendy liberal cause. We protest against things that people won't touch with a 10 foot pole. And you mentioned that we we protested, you know, the Museum of Communism. And this is uh, Tyler McConnell, uh, a CPI member. And yeah. you were there, too, protesting. This is just a short, like, you know, a few seconds from our protest outside the uh, 
the museum of uh, the the museum of communism, uh, the museum of the victims of communism. It's called. Uh, so let me see if I can just pull up the video here. It's doing that thing where it takes. Uh, here we go. Here we go. All right, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, there we go. All right, sorry about that. There we go. And its ruling class wants us to hate China. They want to send. I'm a high school teacher. They want to send 17 and 18 year old poor boys and girls from rural America to go die in a war for Taiwan. Taiwan's a long ways away, all right? China has created a system that's raising up its poorest people, its peasants, raised out of poverty. They're creating a system that gets to the base of the economy and recreates it so that the working class can rise. Unlike in this country, where homeless people sleep a block from the White House. What is that about? You want American boys to fight and die? For what? In China? In Taiwan? No. Let's fix our government right here at home to provide for working people before we go 7,000 miles away to waste young, precious lives over something as dumb as anti-communism. That's right. Yeah. Communism will save America. The greatest lie ever told in this country, the greatest conspiracy theory ever told in America is that communism is bad for work. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Like that's a CPI protest right there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We're going to like the this the museum that tells you communism killed a gajillion gabillion people, you know, the, you know, we're going right there and confronting it right on its face, right? We're not we're not trying to be king of the the liberal protest cage. We're we're doing it and we do protests like that all the time, you know. Um and that kind of protest gets people's attention, it jerks them awake, uh, you know, and and it doesn't accomplish anything close to what, you know, I mean, it accomplishes way more uh, compared to people just getting together and, you know, whatever the latest CNN liberal cause is. I, I think what you're, you're in, um, you're in Wisconsin, right? You're yes. You, Milwaukee, right, Wisconsin. And, yeah. Right. And that, you know, the Kyle Rittenhouse thing was happening and you were telling me about how that, that and abortion yeah. was all the PSL cared about. There's supposed to be this big communist party, right. You know, yep. and that Kyle Rittenhouse and abortion, you know, that was all it was 24 hours a day. I mean, that's well, like, what in the world. Yeah. Because, yeah. You know, it's what happened is, and this is Wisconsinite view, we saw Black Lives Matter and we tried to understand the anger going on and the outbursts and why they would riot, right? And we try to understand it, but we see the results, the destruction of small businesses and even some residential things and just the carnage and death that that is brought out by these riots. And we have to say, look, we understand why you're angry, but this this is not, you know, this this is this is not going to win people over. I'm sorry. And so the the Kyle Rittenhouse case, you know, I don't know if Kyle Rittenhouse was a a good or bad guy personally. I don't know him, right? But ultimately, he represents a desire to protect Kenosha. Right. Yep. And mm -hmm. and the PSL told me when I said we shouldn't go to protest Kyle Rittenhouse. Right. I told them we shouldn't go to protest because the people of Kenosha view Kyle Rittenhouse as protecting. Right. Or mm -hmm. at least having a desire to protect Kenosha from riots. And and their response was stop thinking like a fascist. Mm. That was their response. Don't think like a fascist. Yeah. yeah. As if it's fascist to not want your neighborhood burned down. Yeah. Well, you know, th the wild thing is when I first heard about Kyle Rittenhouse, right, I heard there was a Black Lives Matter protest and some guy so showed up and shot a bunch of people. That's what I heard, which is not what happened. Uh, you know, not what happened at all. But that's the version of events that that I heard. And so I just immediately thought, well, fuck that guy. Right. I hope he goes to jail because, you know, we can't have people. You know, I had the, this image of some like right wing dude who was like, oh, there's people protesting. I'm going to go kill him. I'm going to kill me some protesters. And he went and killed him. Well, you know, and then as the case developed, I learned, oh, wait, you know, uh, it was actually like his neighborhood. Right. It was his relatives car dealership. It wasn't just some random place about protesters he saw on TV. 
oh, wait, he didn't shoot until they were coming for him first. And, and I, you know, I still, I'm not saying I know the expert of the case, but the more I heard about the case, the more I heard people like Jimmy Dore and other people say, mm, this isn't what you heard. The, the people he killed were not black. They were white. Uh, you know, one of the guys was a, was a convicted pedophile, a child molester. Uh, they, he, was, he was fearing for his own life. They were trying to kill him. I was just like, whoa, hold up, you know? Like, and then, you know, when he was acquitted and I was just like, okay, like, I'm still not saying he necessarily didn't do anything wrong, but this isn't the hill I want to die on. Now, all of a sudden, now that I learned didn't kill black people, was defending the card, I'm like, this isn't the hill I want to die on. Immediately after he gets acquitted, all the communist groups, I'm still on all their email lists, Freedom Road, Workers World, PSL, CPUSA, they all blast out, be in the streets, hang, you know, and they, they're basically having a route. They want Kyle Rittenhouse like hung from the highest tree. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, really? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, if I'm as a guy who's been doing communist stuff my whole adult life, if I'm not ready to, to march on, on this, can, I mean, how do you think you're going to reach the millions and millions and millions of Americans who are not with you? Like, this is not a mass issue, right? This is not a mass issue at all, but it's, it's where all the TV cameras were. It's where it was trendy and hip, uh, you right. know? And so, yeah, you know, they, they got on TV mission yeah. accomplished. You got on yeah. TV. Yeah. So I, I am actually working. I, I don't want to give away. I have a work in progress. I have a, a short book I, I'm writing right now that kind of speaks to this. It's a, a message to uh, an older communist activist uh, that I'm working on. I won't say much more about it, but I kind of get into this issue quite a bit because, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I talk about the Boston trap, you know, I mean, that was a mistake. Yeah. You, you know, you, you know, my thing on the Boston trap, you know what I'm talking about? It's a big part of PSL Workers World teaching. It was just pounded into my head when I was in Workers World. 1974, Boston, there were these ugly racist riots against school integration. They were awful. I mean, school, school kids, black kids that were going to white schools were getting beaten up and all of that. And some of the Maoist communist groups, the, the, the October League and the Revolutionary Union, they made the mistake because they said that the answer is communism, not school integration. Right. And they, the black, the black Panthers and a lot of black nationalists were not supporting school integration. They thought, well, we'll, we'll join the racist anti-busing protests and try to point them in like a communist direction. Huge mistake. Big mistake. They were completely wrong to do that. Um, but, the, you know, and Workers World, which PSL is a breakaway from, they say, oh, look how awful that was. And see what we did is we organized this rally that was really liberal that all the Democrats spoke at that was supporting school integration. Uh, you know, so that that shows how great we are. But what they don't realize is that, like, that was a one moment in 1974 where, yes, some communist groups that had the correct orientation, which was out of the movement to the masses. They didn't want to follow what the liberals were doing. They, they were cutting their hair short. They weren't using drugs. They were trying. They were getting jobs in fat. They had the right instinct. But unfortunately, for, they made a mistake. Right. And they take that moment and they project that onto the entire thing. You should never support anything labeled right wing because look what happened in Boston in 1974. And that is a huge mistake because we're living in a period where everything that goes against the establishment gets labeled right wing immediately. That is their response. You're against war with Russia. You're right wing. You question the vaccine. You're right wing. Right. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't want tech censorship. You don't want, you know, the FBI calling up Twitter to decide what goes viral. You must be right wing. And, yeah, yeah. you know, in, in this day and age, if you're going to oppose the ruling class, you have to do things that they are going to call right wing. And you can't well, apply the Boston trap to every situation. Well, and I think, you know, it's a few. It's still amazing to me that people call Jimmy Dore right wing. I, I, <laughs> right. I never. <laughs> what? Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a backwards thinking, I think, going on, because the only people in the establishment who oppose war are like the more like paleocon type, right? So it's almost as if opposing war means that that's what you are in a sense. You know, it's like, because the left opposition to war, they haven't had power. Yeah, loving your mother. Yeah, wanting to have a family is apparently, that's apparently right wing. Um, but, you know, uh, like, uh, yeah, opposing war, right? For moral reasons, as opposed to material, practical, like rational ish reasons, is the that's like the business of the left now. But what about the the 
school of thought, which, by the way, isn't even exclusively communist, that it's simply not uh, uh, it's capitalist dictatorship that is at the root of all of our wars. Right. Yeah. The theory of, of economic imperialism. Right. Why is it that PSL is going to to base their analysis of wars on colonialism? Right. That this is this is what confuses me so much. All of these communist groups, they might support Soviet Russia or even modern China, but they somehow are not able to apply the most basic parts and correct parts of Lenin's analysis, mm -hmm. the most fundamental facts. Why is this? Why are there not Marxist, genuine Marxist economists, right, leading these movements or at least helping to guide them? Or at least people have a basic understanding of this stuff. What? Why? Yeah. Well, classic example of of the lack of understanding of Lenin's theory of imperialism. I I will always remember this is the New York Times ran an article during the Obama years, and they said China won the war in Iraq. Do you remember this? It got widely circulated, and it was about how you know Iraq is an oil producing country, and uh, the USA invaded, claimed there was weapons of mass destruction. There aren't. Now Iraq has been blown to bits, but now the country that gets the majority of Iraq's oil exports is China. So China must have won the war in Iraq because if the USA invaded Iraq to get their oil. Right. And and that was like the most it was like it was like it was a sophisticated psychological operation because people were like, yeah, you know, we invaded Iraq to get their oil, but China gets their oil. So uh, it, it was to mess with your head. Well, the USA didn't invade Iraq to get their oil. Iraqi oil exports are 10% of what they were under Saddam Hussein. The USA invaded Iraq to blow Iraq to shreds and drive them off the oil markets so that all of the people who'd been buying their oil from Iraq now had to buy it from Saudi Arabia or had to buy it from BP and Shell and Chevron or countries that are aligned with the United States, right? And that, that imperialism is not about, it's not like pirates, you know, I'm, give me your booty, argh, give us your oil, Saddam yeah, you know, it's it's about dominating the market, right? And that Iraq was a country that had broken out, Baathist Arab socialism had broken out of their system, had a state-run oil company, and it was competing with them. And so they blew it to bits and they destroyed its state-run oil industry. And then everyone remembers, and I remember when I was a kid, people saying to me, well, you must be stupid to think we invaded Iraq to get their oil because the gas prices went up right after the war in Iraq. <laughs> you bet they did. I remember that when I was a kid, the gas prices were through the roof, you know, and and they were talking about how like our school couldn't afford to like drive people to away games for the basketball games and all this. And all my friends were like, Caleb, you said they invaded Iraq to get the oil, but now gas is more expensive than it ever has been because a major oil producing country got blown to bits. Right. It's not it's not about it's not about getting the physical oil. It's about getting the profits and controlling the oil markets. Right. And that's Lenin's imperialism. It's the export of capital, right? It's 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 making sure that the oil companies based in Western countries are exported all over the world and everyone buys their oil from them. That's what imperialism is. Lenin talks about the domination of the world of, by trusts, cartels, and syndicates, right? The export of capital rather than the export of commodities. This is Lenin's theory of imperialism. And I didn't understand it. You know, if it wasn't for, you know, some some smart old people in New York City that, uh, you know, that, that, that you know, mentored me and taught it to me, thank goodness, I would never have even come to understand it myself. This is just kind of missing the way, like kind of what you're getting at, the way people talk about imperialism is imperialism is white people imposing their culture on brown people or something. It's like, that's not what imperialism is in the yeah, Latin sense at all. You look, know? The, the, the funny thing to me is that your average neoconservative understands this stuff way better than any Marxist. They know exactly what they're doing. Like, mm -hmm. if you want to understand Lenin's imperialism, you can literally read what the stuff that the neocons are describing they want to do and why they're doing it, because that, that gives you the reasons, you know? And I mean, some of them will, will oh, it's the American spirit. We're, this is the spirit of America, <laughs> you know, the, 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 there's, there's some stupid ones, but the smart ones, they know exactly what they're doing, you know? Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, with China, it's blatant now. They say, well, Huawei, they make better phones than Apple does. And we can't have that. Countries need to buy their telecommunications from America, not China. Uh, you know, uh, China, uh, they were building, they recently built a computer chip factory. And this is, this is great. It's a computer chip factory with using China 
domestic Chinese materials and supplies to make computer chips to be sold in China, right? It is China, Chinese supplies, Chinese corporation to be sold in the Chinese market. But there was, you know, there was legislation proposed by Democrats and Republicans to like declare this, this illegal, right? China does not have the right to make these computer chips. Why? Because they want China to buy their computer chips from the United States. That's, that's what they want. And they openly said that around Taiwan, chip dominance. That's what they said. That's imperialism, right? Imperialism right. is about holding back economic development. Um, you know, that's what it's really about. And, uh, you know, I don't know, there was a, a movie, uh, that came out right after Donald Trump got elected. I don't know. Did you see it? A uh, Beatrice at dinner, I think is what it was called. It was Selma Hayek was in it. Was it Beatrice at dinner? Did you see this movie? No. Have you, have you seen it? Beatrice at dinner. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Selma Hayek, Beatrice at dinner. And it was a movie. Uh, and it was like, it was like this wealthy California family, uh, they're having a dinner party and this uh, this this Native American woman uh, who's from Central America, who's like indigenous, uh, who like does naturopath medicine for them is staying over. And they invite over this friend of theirs who's like a, a greedy, evil, greedy capitalist. Right. And the two of them like have an argument all night. That's what it's about. Right. And it's supposed to be like the left versus the right. Right. And John Lithgow is the evil, greedy capitalist. And Selma Hayek is this beautiful Native American indigenous person. And I'm watching this and I'm like, this is what like the woke left thinks imperialism is, right? It's that, you know, the 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 evil capitalist is all like, I want to build and construct. I'm not like those Wall Street guys that just make money from derivative ripoffs. I want to build. And she's all like, oh, Mother Earth is beautiful and you you want to destroy nature. And I, I hug trees and oh, my God, our beautiful indigenous ways are being destroyed by your... And it's like, that's what they think imperialism is. They think it's like Fern Gully or some shit, right? That It's the opposite. It's that imperialism is about keeping countries in a state of underdevelopment, keeping them from having highways, keeping them from having power plants, keeping them from having literacy in schools and hospitals. And, and you know, and the national liberation movements like, you know, in, in Cuba and in Central America and elsewhere have been saying, we're going to break out of your system so we can build, so we can construct. And they right. don't get this, right? Yeah. Why do they say Cuba? They act as though Cuba wants to be impoverished. Yeah. They act mm -hmm. as though, I've heard people genuinely say, because Cuba couldn't get access to pesticides, they have organic farms. And so it's so good for the Cubans' <laughs> health that it's all organic. Yeah, and it takes up three times the land to farm the same amount of food because you don't have freaking pesticides. Like, yeah. the, the, there's yeah, no practicality in them. Yeah, and despite all of my disagreements with them, that is one thing I do credit the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche movement with, right? Is that yeah. they, you know, they saw early on that the new left, you know, they were promoting this narrative. It's as small as beautiful degrowth, right? And that Marxism and Lenin's theory of imperialism and degrowth do not go hand in hand whatsoever. And in fact, the ultimate goal of communism, right, is a world with so much wealth and so much abundance that the state can fade away, right? That, that there'll be so much for everybody that people just work because they feel like working. You know, the free ind development of every individual is the development of all, no coercion, you know, you know, I mean, that's our ultimate goal. And that requires building. You know, and maybe we need to build in ways that are more sustainable and efficient. Maybe fossil fuels isn't the way to build. Maybe we got to go to fusion energy, right? I'm not saying all environmentalism is bullshit. I, I am not right. convinced. You know, there are some people I know that, that are really convinced that, that you know, that global warming is a hoax. I'm not convinced, right? I see erratic weather patterns and I'm not ready to say global warming is a hoax. I think climate alarmism and telling us that it's an emergency, so we must degrow, that's a hoax. But, you know, I think climate change is a problem. It's a reality. No. And, but, you know, listen, if you're watching this, you have your own view on climate change. Caleb is not telling you how to think right now. OK, yeah. this is this is an opinion that's based on the limited knowledge. Right. That yeah. a, a non climate scientist has. Right. I'm not a climate scientist and my view is very similar, to be honest. But, you know, we're not telling you how to think. No, don't, don't go arguing the exact same thing that we're saying. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, There's diversity yeah. of views in our organization, right? Right, I mean, right. 
Absolutely. But, you know, but we're about construction. We're about right, building. Right. We're about moving ahead and celebrating what it is that makes human beings human beings, which is that they have creative power. The yeah. ants have been building their ant farms the same way for a million years. You know, that, that uh, you know, that beavers have been building their beaver dams the same way for a million years. But in just six, seven, eight thousand years, human beings, we've gone from hunter gatherers in the woods to space travel to iPhones to, you know, you know, remote, you know, broadcasted conversations like this one. Yeah, that shows something really beautiful in human beings. And that 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 means we need to love each other. Right. Because that is really special and that humans are full of great great potential, right? And you can't be a misanthropic individual. You can't hate humanity and be a communist. You know, it is about loving humanity and building. Wow. This has been an amazing conversation, Sam. It was yeah. really a pleasure to have you here. Do you want to end? Do you want to, you want to make any closing points before you go? Um, I'll just say this much. Um, you know, I'm just remembering in my head, these nights that we've had at CPI gatherings, or, you know, when we're staying in the same building and you're just talking to these like-minded people and these, these debates that we have with each other. We love to debate. And, and this is the thing that, I, honestly, I think this separates CPI from PSL in a big way for me personally, is that we have spirited, well-intentioned debates. And we really, you know, mentally try to, to develop each other and share knowledge with each other to to further our, to further our thinking and i just remember all the great conversations and connections and silly antics and just all the you know all those little things i remember cracking jokes constantly with tyler and peter uh coffin you know i just so many so many good memories that i have with cpi and i feel like i didn't emphasize enough you know because it's hard to articulate just how important and fulfilling these experiences can be. And you really don't know unless you go and, and attend. So I really encourage anyone watching, you know, with, before a protest, bef you have a massive sense of dread oftentimes. You really don't want to do it. You almost want to stop being a communist because it's too much work, right? But the minute in, a minute in, giving a speech and speaking your heart to the public it completely changes and it's actually amazing. And, and the moment you overcome that dread and anxiety and, and your, your um, I don't know the right word, but the moment you overcome that and you open your heart to something and you, you pursue it and you really go for it, right? You, everything changes, everything changes. And so my suggestion, anyone watching right now, if you have any reservations, is the word I was thinking of, if you have any reservations about coming to a CPI event, if you have any reservations about being a communist, if you have any reservations about protesting, just know that the moment that you actually go and do it, all of that will disappear and you will feel amazing. And it will change your life. You become more confident, right? You will form genuine connections, lasting connections, meaningful connections with people that you never thought you could. And, and that's, that's, my, that's what I really want to drive home tonight. So thanks for having me on, Caleb. It's been a great conversation. Um, I would totally do this again. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's think about that possibility and, and, uh, Thanks Absolutely. so much for having me on. Yeah. Absolutely. And and be sure to, you know, make sure we'll we'll be sure to put your link in the description. Go subscribe to Sam's YouTube channel. He does great videos on a lot of different great topics. Good luck with everything, Sam. It was really, really a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank very you much. so much. Yep. All right. Well, that was a great uh, opening segment. Uh, so why don't we do our roll call? Names and locations. Name